So my first business venture was with this guy that ended up to be a professional con man. There was a there was a, there was a shotgun, and I will never forget seeing a shotgun lit up by the moonlight. And then there was this squirt of adrenaline in my stomach. It was like a little, you know, that little punch. Um, and it hit home. He was he was going to kill me. God, you guys are going to have an amazing, amazing, amazing treat today. So I met Chris Dutton um, when, and he's the founder of CEO Magazine. You'll meet him in a second. But I met him when he organized this incredible retreat um, to Richard Branson's private island, Necker Island. For me, it was one of the most incredible um, experiences of my life. And I immediately knew that this guy is absolutely unstoppable and he has an incredible story. So buckle up. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. What a lovely introduction. That's one of the best ones I've ever had. <laughs> and you've been incredible. Um, and it's so inspiring to see that, you know, you started CO Magazine from basically nothing and you created this empire global publication that is just way beyond just a publication. And, and tell us a little bit about your story, Chris, because I found just the bits of pieces of it so inspiring. Um, okay, well, thank you. Um, so I was um, born in England originally. Um, I moved to Australia in 2005. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what happened before that in a minute and um I was kind of in Australia um enjoying life for a few months with um with savings that saved up back in England and the, basically the money was getting low and you know neither myself or my ex-wife um we didn't have any sort of income um and she um so we were in Sydney um and she uh she got a job um which was great but um I remember thinking to myself, you know, oh, shit, I need to earn some money now. Um, we probably had enough to cover um, rent, but, but that was kind of it. Um, so she'd gone off and got a job, and I distinctly remember sitting in um, a spare bedroom um, when she went off for day one at work, thinking, I remember sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? <laughs> Literally, what am I going to do? Um, but I was I was fueled inside, basically, by what happened back in England, um, before we moved to Australia, and that's that's probably why I decided to do what I do today. Um, but yeah, I had I had I came from England, moved to Australia. Uh, I had nothing except for a PC and the internet, and I started the CEO magazine literally with fifty dollars from that spare bedroom. Um, we're now a global brand. We speak to more CEOs than any other magazine in the world, and we have a brand reach every month of sort of. 13 million um yeah so that's from 50 dollars from a spare bedroom to where we are now we're, yeah we're, we're doing okay wow what an incredible story and i have a feeling you're hiding some pretty <laughs> interesting story behind it because it wasn't smooth sailing was it um not really no um it, <sighs> This, it kind of makes me think about kind of some of the hardest or sort of worst moments in your life. Um, and yeah, smooth sailing is never a, never a thing, I think. But, you know, when I knew I was doing this podcast, I thought, you know, what can I, what what's kind of like the worst thing that's happened to me that could potentially be of value somehow to the, the, the people listening to this podcast? Um but the answer is an easy one, and it's a it's a defining moment in my life that that I'm going to share. Um, but it's actually one of the best things that ever happened to me, even though it was shocking um, and horrific at the time. So, aside from Australia, there's a bit of background. I started my career working in um, a tough call centre, um, selling advertising back in the UK. Um, I was young, successful. I was earning great money. You know, I was buying my mates drinks. I was the, I was this sales rep in this boiler room type place, um, and it was amazing. I was buying my mates din dinner, drinks, and you know, I was I was young and I was going places. 
Um, there were 120 salespeople in that company. Um, and when I left, I, I left as the second best salesperson they ever had, which still annoys me a little bit because I wasn't number one. Um, but the reason I left that company was because I got um, headhunted by the Yellow Pages, um, which was great. You know, I was on the way up and Yellow Pages were calling in and trying to headhunt our best sales reps and they got in touch with me and off I went. Um, so I started that job at the Yellow Pages um, and the story I'm talking about, I, I met this guy called Sean um, and something just felt right with him. Um, he was older than me, steely-faced, streetwise he was successful he'd been there and done it um in advertising and i kind of saw him at, um as a as a role model um and it it's not easy when you're working at the, the yellow pages it's a tough gig you know there's long hours and they got they got every ounce of sweat out of you but um sean he was kind of there for me i met him on the training course um, he he supported me when I was out on the road late at night trying to sell advertising into their directories. Um, you, you needed someone in the trench with you at the end of the phone for you. And Sean was kind of, he was that guy. I looked up to him and, you know, I'd call him on, you know, I'm going to go and pitch an electrician for something. And, you know, I'd ring him up and say, what do you reckon? And he'd give me some tips. And we became close. We bonded. Um, so he helped me through the tough times Um basically in sort of the first six months of learning to adapt to a new hard company um and during that time he convinced me that i was i was too good basically to work for someone else um and he said the only way to earn money in this world is to start your own business um that's what he said and it turned out that he had some contacts and you know we we ended up starting up our own company um selling and installing kitchens of all things now i plowed everything i had saved up basically working in the previous role i would got money in the bank i'd saved up everything i'd owned into this new business with him and i was excited and this was like i was early 20s this was my first ever business um but it wasn't all sm it wasn't all plain sailing um things started to go wrong um money wasn't coming in despite deals being signed. Um, the bank accounts were soon overdrawn and, you know, we, we were getting these dreaded repayment phone calls coming in onto my mobile. I was like, oh God, I didn't want to answer this phone. Legal action. There was, it was something, it was weird. But to cut a long story short, it turned out that um, Sean had been around the block. Uh, he was, he was actually wanted um, by the police. So, I, I, I learned that he was he was actually a professional con man. Um, and when I re actually I get shivers literally down my back talking about this. Um, so my first business venture was with this guy that ended up to be a professional con man. Um, and he got me hook, line and sinker. But um, when I realized this, I kind of had this realization of, oh, you know, crap, everything I've put into it. I mean, I'm in business with the wrong guy. He, he was a con man. So. I, I asked for money for my money back and, you know, I stood up to him and, you know, I was like, mate, I've got bills to pay. You know, I need the money. It turns out he was pocketing the money and I wasn't getting my cut to pay the bills. And I stood up to him and said, I need, I need the money. Um, and he went quiet for a while and eventually said, okay, you know, let's, you know, let's, I'll give you your money. And um, we arranged to meet. Now at the time, my best mate back in England, he was, um, he was a security guard. He actually worked in a prison. Um, and we drove to the, I remember we drove to the outskirts of London and I took him with me for insurance, basically. Um, and I was going to get the money that he he owed me. Um, Sean and me, we'd arranged to meet in a, in a public place. Um, but Sean, he, he changed the meeting like last minute when it was a couple of minutes away um, from meeting i think it was, we were meant to meet at mcdonald's and he said oh we can't meet it's full up you know there's a car park down the road um and he said let's meet here so um we pulled into this car park at night time um and i'll never forget it um it was dark but the, the moon was bright and i pulled in with my mate and then i saw sean's car and then he, he got out and he um we pulled up and he headed around the 
back of the car um, into his boot, and he opened it, and there was a there was a, there was a shotgun, and I will never forget seeing a shotgun with uh, he was a professional comment, obviously lit up by the moonlight, and then there was this squirt of adrenaline in my stomach. It was like a little you know that little punch, um, and it hit home. He was he was going to kill me. He wanted me out of the way. Um, it was that moment in life where I thought, crikey, I'm, I'm going to die. Um, I felt that. So we, Faf being the security guard, his eyes lit up and he screeched the car around and we just drove off as fast as we could. Um, I deleted all of his numbers. I decided to cut my losses um, as I wasn't prepared to die for money. Um, but at the end of the day, I'd lost everything I'd worked for. You know, I was I was successful. I had tens of thousands of pounds in the bank account at an early age. I had a premium job, you know, convertible sports car. It was literally gone overnight. Um, how did that make me feel? Um, I don't know. Put it this way, I hated him. Um, it was a it was a hammer. It was a hammer blow to me. Um, but it's strange because if I could talk to that young man some 25 years ago, you know, a 20 something year old Chris Dutton, um, I would have kind of told him to get rid of the resentment in your heart, you know, get rid of it and move on. Um, because those, those resentments will always end up harming you and, and, you know, creating in you like this sense of despair, you've got to let it go. So basically, Sean, he took Everything that I worked for, that I had, he spat me out like a worthless piece of old chewing gum, and he was going to kill me. Um, he was evil. Um, you know, he was. I remember that saying. He was like a snake in the grass. But I think what I'm trying to say is that no one ever. You know, you don't. You don't die from a snake bite. You know, the snake bite will never kill you. It's the it's the the venom that continues to pour through your body after that bite that's what will destroy you um and you know and you were living with that because it's hard to get rid of something so horrifying to trust people again to right i mean i assume there's a lot of that going on too absolutely um but i kind of often think about you know what would i say to myself as a kid um and i'm kind of like you know I, I, if I could, it's kind of, I went from this to almost being shot. Um, but I think you've got to harness the setbacks, you know, use them as positives and get rid of that resentment. And Alana, honestly, ironically, I'm actually glad it happened um, because as horrific as it was at the time, he taught me a lesson and that lesson improved my life. And it actually helped me become me, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, wow. it wasn't all plain sailing. Life has ups and downs, and you know, you deal with the downs. But at the end of the day, it's I th- I, it's how you let it affect you that shapes you. That's that's where my head's at now. Oh, it's and it, that's such a strong sentence, right? Because it's never uh, you know the challenges themselves. It's your belief around these challenges that will set you back, right? So. But tell me, I mean, this is an incredible story. And still, you decide to start your own business with no money, nothing, basically, instead of just going to get a job. First of all, why? And how did you start CEO Magazine? Well, I, because of what happened, I had, um, I had no credit rates. I couldn't get a job, literally. Um, I I had nothing, and the only place I could get a job was in um in a chicken factory, literally with illegal immigrants that would come in, and we could only work for cash. Um, but that's all I could get. Um, I started the same magazine when I came to Australia, but I remember before I was coming to Australia, I had this little locker in the the chicken factory. It was cold. It was awful conditions, and you saw people getting stabbed and stuff. And I had this little marker pen and I remember counting down the days until he used to come to Australia but but yeah as soon as as soon as we got here um got to Australia and then that's when I mentioned about my ex-wife my my wife at the time she got her job and then I was kind of using that setback about what had happened in England to think you know I don't have anything at the moment I've got 50 bucks literally 
um, she could pay the bills, she could pay the rent, and I need to start something. So I used my media experience from having worked in publishing and advertising back in back in the UK, and I thought, yeah, I'll start a business. I'll start a magazine. And that's incredible because that's really, really hard. So what motivates you? What made you continue? Um, Probably... I think that question comes down to um, it's interesting because what probably what probably motivates me and helped me as kind of a startup early days, it was probably no one. Um, and so, so when I started to see amazing, when I look back on it, what motivated me was the fact that there wasn't a rule book to follow. It's there wasn't a PDF that I could download to say. Hey, you want to launch a global business magazine? This is what you do. Um, but that in essence, that in essence was kind of like the reason probably why it became successful, because you know, you just trust your gut, you trust your instinct, you, you do what you think is right. Um, there were no rules, you know. I'd never started a magazine before. Yes, I had media experience, but you know, I'd never even done anything like that before. So you kind of trust yourself, um, you actually help yourself. Um certainly an interesting journey, just yeah, just let's start a magazine and you just kind of do what you think is right, basically. And that's incredible. And now that you see it in retrospect, right, you're talking to some of the most incredible CEOs in the world, you feature them in the magazine. Tell me a little bit about what does it feel now that you're looking back um, and seeing where where this is today? Um. I feel I feel happy and I feel proud when I see impact it makes on other people. Um, I I feel I've always said that, um, you know, a lot of people kind of say to me, you know, oh, you've done well, you know, you've you've successful, you've you've made it whatever. But to me, I feel that that is such a dangerous position to be in because the minute I think the minute you kind of go, yeah, I've I've done it. I've launched a magazine. It's you know, it's it's globally recognized the minute you fall into that comfort zone the minute you kind of go yeah do you know what we've done it it's dangerous because you stop trying you stop you know you stop pushing you stop that that sort of the person that's inside of you kind of relaxes and goes to sleep a bit and I never want to be that person so there's still lots to do and I love that so I mean you keep pushing and pushing which is what makes you such a brilliant entrepreneur right but how do you measure success? Like, how do you feel, you know, and tell yourself, okay, so I've had these sort of milestones or whatever. Like, how do you measure success? Um, In the magazine or personally? So just kind of it, Yeah, I mean, uh, success to me is, I mean, I think I can sum it up probably fairly easily. And this is, the, the answer is actually a powerful question. And I've been asked this before, but people say, how do you measure success? And to me, the answer is, um, do the people I love most care about me? Because that answers the question about business. It answers the question about life. It answers the question about everything. So if, if you know, the day you, you close your eyes or whatever, and, you know, you, you move on from this world, you ask yourself, do the people I love most care about me? If the answer is yes, then to me, that's success. Wow. So I have to ask you a follow up on this because on one hand, there's the people that really love you. On the other hand, when you're an entrepreneur, there's always going to be haters. There's always going to be people that really test how thick is your skin, right? So, so how do you balance? Because you're not going to always be loved. You're going to be loved by the people who love you and that are inspired by you, but there's going to be the haters. How do you balance that? Um, that's a good question, actually. Um we've had a lot of um people that do hate us because you know we've we've done well and we've become who we are but um i think we we've i think the haters and i think people that we've had people try and copy the brand you know we've had people that have produced their own magazines because you know because they think they can earn money off it and we've had the people try and take us down and i the the mindset to me is you know if you've got haters if you've got people that are you know copying you if you've got people that are trying to be in competition with you you've got to take it as a positive because it means you're doing something right 
Um, so if you don't have haters, if you don't have the people coming out, giving you competition, that's not a good thing. The fact that you've got haters and you've got this is is awesome because it means you're on the right path. It means you're doing something right. That's kind of oh, I where my head answer. sits. <laughs> I love this answer, which is so true. Um, because again, they always exist, right? Um, but tell me again, uh, I want to hear a little bit of, you know, less than famous word for you. And I will also add to the audience, um, if you're an incredible CEO running a mid to big organization, right? And you want to be featured in CEO magazine, I can't think of a better place to get the platform that you guys have, right? And and the visibility that you guys have. Um, so this is more for my audience, but what are some of your kind of last famous words for our audience? Um, I, th I suppose, um, I think probably it might come down to, um, it probably would come down to um, help and support, I think, um, because I think it's important to say that, um, anyone starting their own business, anything like this, um, probably the last sort of famous words would be is when when I started the CEO magazine, um, there, there, was, there was no one around to help. Um, it's, you know, it, there, there wasn't this rule book to follow, like I said, you know, it's all that sort of stuff. But um, I think when you start, there's, there's no help and you actually have to help yourself. Um, it's different when business grows and starts to become successful because then other people will come in and, try and you know help you and come to you in terms of partnership support and everything like that um but you know there's there's guys like john caragonis from the ceo circle richard branson you know i've been offered good advice along the way um my two daughters support me and help me in ways that they can't even comprehend um but you know my partner sophie she gives me a, a shoulder to cry on and a glass of wine to laugh over when things are good or bad or whatever but that's kind of like all post startup. Um, I think it's important to mention to listeners that, you know, at the start, I genuinely believe that the only person that can kind of help you is yourself. Um, help, help comes in different forms at different times. You know, you can have all the, the support you want as a startup. Um, but if at, heart, if at heart, and this is probably this is something to really sort of think the listeners should probably think about this if, if I could give one piece of advice it's like if at heart you don't have the you need this burning desire to succeed you need this genuine unshakable belief that failure isn't an option um which sometimes comes from adversity like I had but if you don't have that if you don't have that that inner belief that failure is not an option then your road to success just becomes a path to mediocrity that most people are quite happy to walk on does that make sense it does it does so first of all i think it's incredible what you said because at the end of the day yes you can have coaches and you can have education and you can have people to lean on but at the end of the day if you can't motivate yourself if you can't push higher if you are willing to just settle for mediocrity you're absolutely, you know, the, 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 nobody else can kind of push you forward. Right. Um, so, so all the rest is it's going to happen within, right. It's your mindset. It's, you know, and how do you catapult yourself and, you know, and push yourself higher. Um, and I love that, Chris. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much for inspiring, for sharing your story. Um, Folks, CEOs, if you want, you know, we're going to have all the information for Chris. Um, can't stress it enough. Like amazing connection to be part of. Um, definitely meeting next time in Necker Island. And <laughs> amazing. Oh, Chris, it was so awesome to have you. Thanks, Alana. Keep up the good work. You're amazing. <laughs>